Yeah, so look, I, I just want to thank everybody for participating. And I think this is a pretty good opportunity to, to give you a little idea, a little flavor of what I do with this whole mental performance stuff. Um, but I want to say I, what I'm going to try to to help you understand is you can if you don't do Dr. Clyde's nutritional program, you can still use your head and get beyond that. That, that that's, that's a goal. So because sometimes simpler is better. So that that is the ultimate goal to keep it keep it simple. So my name is Ted and I know most of you in the room and actually on online. So I coming to this from a as a second career, having a been in kind of tech, uh, running a couple of professional teams. Uh, thanks in part to uh, James, who's here, and uh, Mark Lady, who's on the on the line, who kind of inspired me to try this bike racing team management stuff. So that was actually a, a fun aside. And I found that through my experience bike racing, um, I learned about the power of the team, and the power of that greater purpose, having something beyond yourself. Sometimes it actually takes the pressure off yourself when you have that purpose that's bigger than yourself to help you uh, achieve more and actually push your performance potential. Um, so I'm going to start with first asking everyone to uh, acknowledge kind of what we oops, what we're here to uh, to do to learn as well as recognize that we're sacrificing parts of our day to be here and listen to this. And so you may have lots of thoughts swirling around your mind right now. So I'm going to, as I just realized the slide deck isn't moving. So I'm gonna just go to, here it goes. Yeah, I'm tapping the, yeah, that's work. Or, um, everything's good. We're gonna go to a breathing exercise and straight to a, what we call straw breaths. So everyone's probably familiar with Deep breathing. So, so everyone put uh, two fingers on their chest and two fingers on their, the other two fingers on their belly. So the idea is when you're breathing in deeply, your belly is, you know, distends and comes back. Your, ch your chest shouldn't move so much and you should not feel your shoulders going up and down because having your shoulders go up and down means you're doing shallow chest breaths. So what I want to ask everyone to do, see if we can get in sync, is big exhale now. Big exhale through your mouth, through the mask. And as you inhale, I want to do a count of four, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000. Hold it for four, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000. Exhale for eight, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000, six, 1,000, seven, 1,000. So we'll do that again. Inhale, two, three, four, hold it, two, three, four, big exhale as if through a straw, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now continue this. And as you're breathing, I want each of you with your inside voice to see Notice what are three things you can feel, whether it's your butt touching the seat, clothes on your body, now what are three things you can taste? Maybe it was the water you drank. And you can continue this diaphragmatic breathing or straw breathing. What are three things you can hear besides my voice? And now lightly close your eyes. And what are three things you can see through your closed eyelids? If anything, Maybe there's light through the eyelids. Perfect. Now, is there any sense I've left out of the five senses? Your sense of smell. Thank you. 
And let's trust Christine for reminding me. So what are three things you can smell at this moment? Now, as you continue breathing, as if through a straw, these large breaths. In this relative silence, are there thoughts, emotions that you're having right now? And can you just see if you can put them on one of those parade floats each thought so that it just kind of passes on by and you're looking at the thought, observing the thought. And if you can't observe it and you're sucked into that thought, that's fine. But just, this is really just an acknowledgement exercise to see if you can distance yourself from what might be marching through your mind. And when you're ready, you guys can just come back to present. Uh, this was just a short exercise in, I would almost call it a mindfulness exercise, but the idea is to just see if we can distance ourselves sometimes from what we're thinking. Um, and what we did was essentially anchor ourselves. So you see a lot of elite athletes do the deep breaths before they're about to go on stage or do their dive or their gymnastic routine, or in some cases before the criterium starts <laughs> trying to gather your thoughts, you're trying to center yourself. So if you do something as easy as three deep straw breaths, which takes like 30 seconds, you are actually physiologically slowing things down and calming yourself, right? With the fight or fights, um, you can actually calm your nervous system. So this is something that all of us do unconsciously, but sometimes you can do it more consciously or more intentionally. So I'm just saying, try this sometime after you get an argument, before you react to your emotions, see if like I do sometimes, can we actually take a step back by taking a breath and then you probably will short circuit a lot of extra cycles. So, um, and what can this help for? So what I wanted to do is start with um, some common scenarios in cycling that we often face, but I wanted, since we have a small group, to go to you to see if you have any other ones. So I don't know, and I keep looking at you uh, because I'm like thinking, oh, there's, common performance scenarios I still have, that we still have where you've trained really hard, you feel really good, yet you're really nervous. Is that sometimes the case? Like you think you should be so prepared, you shouldn't be nervous. And then your mind starts spinning, like why am I nervous? Because I'm, I'm so well-trained. Or you know, the flip side is you don't feel like you're ready. You didn't train enough. You feel under-trained and you're worried, worried about your competition. Or let's say you're, you went on a ride this morning or the morning ride and you're just looking at all these people on their fast bikes and you're going, my bike's not as fast or I'm not as good. And you, you start um, stressing yourself out or during the ride. So again, I go back to seeing Amy and her son on the morning ride and you're just at your limit. Clearly nobody's talking. Um, and you start wondering, can I keep this up? When am I going to get dropped? You go straight toward like catastrophization or, you know, oh, I, I can't do this. Um, or it could be, you know, what if scenarios? What if I can't do this? Um, this is all or nothing. I'm going to get dropped and everything's going to be horrible. But any, anyone else have any other, any other performance issues that you can think of that's uh, tip of the spear or front and center or are these pretty common? I don't know if, can people talk online actually? They can. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just like asking. Yeah, so, but anyone else have anything or these, these, are, these are pretty common. So, you know, the question is also, how often do you lose focus as a result of all of this? Probably, probably pretty often. So these are all things 
that mental performance training can help. And some of us have natural responses to this and others, are, they're not so natural. And so what I figured out was I wish I knew a lot of this before um, I started my sports career, but unfortunately I learned a lot of this the hard way. And then, but by observing teammates, observing um, friends and you know, other people, you start and obviously school helped a little bit, but you start learning the mechanisms behind how do you how do you cope with these things. So um, going to, would you like to do the following? But how would you would you like to better handle some of these stressors? Um, get more out of your training and racing. Um, increase your not only your self belief but your ability to handle multiple stressors. Um, I keep looking at James when I see this because I because he's actually part of one of the reasons I got into sports psychology was his ability to be impervious to, to some of these stressors compared to some of my teammates, and it was actually uh, inspiring but at the same time perplexing. Um, like how does how does how did he do that? And then there's the um, how do you perform better and be more consistent? And so um, I actually want to jump to a oh, totally this is totally random, but Again, going back to when we had Chris Horner, uh, who is a kind of a, a famous cyclist in, I think, some of our minds, um, who won the Vuelta at age 42. But, but what he did um, was he loved it when he had teammates who were consistent and performed consistently. And James like was one of them, where like he could just say, on this day, I can trust that, that James will take me to be able to take me to the front and do you know x y and z consistently whereas we had other teammates who went to the lab tested off the charts in the vo2 but couldn't be trusted to perform consistently so it's better to have someone perhaps not be as physically talent physiologically talented but still have a, that consistency so i think that having that mental resilience and the mental toughness is is as paramount to that so that's a lot of the things that uh, mental performance training does. And so what are some of those things? Um, how do you, how do you get to this level? Um, well, there's what we call your mental, your performance toolkit. And so everyone's heard of, uh, things like imagery, self-talk, um, affirmations, mantras, does most of you know how they, how you use those? Like anyone have an example? of how they might have used something yeah in the morning i have it on my mirror and i just say them to myself or read it off yeah yeah like or ted lasso how many of you seen ted lasso with the believe right right there that's like a that's something you can use to remind yourself and usually what what goes along with a mantra or an affirmation is some image like what does believe believe mean to you or what does you got this due to you. And so something that's really effective to do, let's say um, in the middle of a workout. So I'm gonna go back to the morning ride because there's people here who've done this and continue to do it. Is like, you're about, you feel like you're gonna get dropped. But as we know, the mind is your governor and you can go beyond what your mind is telling you to do if you switch gears in your mind. So you could say something as simple as, no, don't get dropped. But you know, studies have shown that if you see something more positive, like, like you got this, and actually in third person, it's actually more effective than you say, I got this. Um, maybe because it's that, it, because it's not putting pressure on yourself as much if it's a third person thing. But what you do is you, you can say something as simple as that, or just push, 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 or what we call do an instructional cue. So go to something technique oriented, that will actually inspire you to do something else. So what you're actually doing is distracting yourself from the pain of the effort by going to something technique focused. So let's say, I don't know, Christine, if when you were time trialing, did you ever focus on form when you were suffering? So maybe cadence. cadence. Yeah. So you focus on, you know, get ratcheting up the cadence and then a way you're distracting yourself from the pain of the lactic acid buildup. Um, and same thing that um, this is this is not mental, but actually it is. There are studies that have shown that they had a 
take a electro, an energy drink with no calories and an energy drink with so artificial sweetener with an energy drink with calories, it, there's a placebo effect that if you feel like you're having something sweet, even though it has no calories, it will give you an artificial boost of energy, but it's all, it's all mental. I think, yeah, you've heard this. Um, you, you probably heard this. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. Belief. Yeah. So, so that's a big part. So, um, and there's also a lot of studies saying that your mind govern or shuts your body down when you have 20% left. I don't know if this is a, a trained athlete or not, but that's why you can push yourself. Like you see people push themselves and they collapse after the finish line. But that's because they set that finish line there. What if the finish line were like a mile further? You know, who knows what you could be capable of? So the point is you can push yourself further than you believe you can. And a lot of it's just how do you distract yourself or trick yourself into pushing yourself further? Um, and so I talk a little bit about self-talk. Now with the self-talk, um, you can integrate that with the imagery piece. And I kind of wanted to switch back straight back to uh, Christine um, since she's here and kind of tell you a little story of her imagery practice. So you might have, some of you heard her yesterday in her journey to the Olympics and how she had a pretty rapid, um, I guess, trajectory to winning the Olympic trials. So she, you know, she basically looked at the, oh, did you tell this? And looked, looked at the course, went down. I just go into what my imagery Yeah, so basically, you know, she went in February of 2004, went to the Olympic trials course in Southern California, drove the course, rode the course, memorized the course. And then she was working full time and driving to San Francisco the months uh, after or four months. And she would pretty often while driving to work, visualize herself writing certain parts of the course, or maybe even writing the whole course. Um, and then she would also um, even imagine herself on the podium, like having the fastest time. And all of this, what is doing do for her is building her self belief, her kind of, as well as her self confidence. And then, you know, come the Olympic trials, she also, I forgot to mention, would also build into the imagery, what if things went wrong? Like if there were, what, what's my contingency plan? So you can do all of that. Um, and then she was able to you know, win the Olympic trials after whatever, four months of preparation, not five months of preparation. So not that much, honestly, but it was very focused. And then actually, Christine, do you wanna share kind of one of your, how did you stay so focused as a focusing tip you might pass along? Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing that I actually want to mention is, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So, so what Christine had said that part of what I think made her focus so good is that she could a compartmentalize things, and when she was hyper focused, she could also shut out a lot of the extraneous thoughts that were coming into mind that would mostly most be most distracting for a lot of us. And I wanted to also add that one of the things I observed as her partner was the ability to reframe situations really quickly. And that's something I'm not able to do that fast. It's like, so when I asked her once, are you a perfectionist? And she said, hell no. I'm like, really? But you do things at such a high level. And she's like, well, I just, well, if you're going to take time to do something, you might as well do it well. But at the same time, if I do something wrong, I learn from it and just move on. I'm like, wow, what a, what a, what an amazing personality trait to be able to just pivot like that. But that's actually what happens and how you're able to um, cope with things. The more and more you practice something and gain confidence, something 
because it allows you to be able to mentally reframe the situation and look at you know things as opportunities because you know it's not the end of the world. Um, and that was one of the things I wanted to mention was the other huge, um, I guess, a reason you can reframe is if you're able to ask yourself the question, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? Because if you could, like, you're not going to die. Like, if you, you know, like, sometimes we have this, this is totally aside, but, like, some of us have eating issues where we're like, oh, we don't want to eat this donut. But, like, I know it's just, you think it's a slippery slope, but what is the worst thing that could happen? You might as well just enjoy the thing you're thinking about and then move on. But know that, you know, you don't have to eat it all the time. So I, that's, that's an aside, but that's just, just so many different ways to refrain. Um, and part of this is, and this is what I'm actually doing with the current future business is along with the reframe is developing the story that you want to tell yourself, right? Cause sometimes this is the inner voice speaking out the story and the language you use, um, on yourself dictates not only how you're perceived by others, but how you perceive yourself. And so having that positive story is hugely important. Um, and it doesn't come sometimes easily for a lot of us. I mean, I know for myself, I have a lot of baggage with trying to develop a positive story. So the more you can think about your own story and the more positive you can make it and using reframing as one trick to reframe situations where it doesn't seem so positive, but you can actually make it positive, you can flip it around, it's going to do wonders for your, your self-confidence and your self-belief. Um, and all of this requires pretty intense practice. So when Christine was doing, going back to her imagery, I was using, actually this line was based on her story is that she practiced the imagery piece pretty often. You get it? Cause you can't just, pr pr you know, imagine that you're going to win once and that's enough. You have to kind of keep that over and over again. And I just also realized for myself that I was pretty good at peaking for events because I would get, that's how you get yourself psyched up, right? So when you do all this imagery practice, you're actually probably building up, some, got a little dopamine. I mean, you're doing, you're doing things that you're, you're influencing your hormone levels um, by doing that. So whether it's do something, doing something as dumb as getting amped up for the morning ride, right? It's, you're still, you're still using visualization or imagery um, in order to get pumped up for something. And that's something you can do sometimes when you're not feeling very motivated. So for example, if you're not feeling motivated and you're lethargic, you can do anything from, we talked about the slow breathing to kind of hyperventilating breathing where you're going in and out, breathing in and out really fast to pump yourself up to doing some imagery practice to get yourself in the right mind, the headspace. Because right, the, the whole goal of what I do with individuals to help is to, individuals is to help them achieve flow state so does everyone know th when do they think of flow state what do you guys think of as your flow state any yeah go ahead my experience it's like timeless you don't anything everything happens slow and it's like oh everything is just happening but it seems like slow motion. slow motion and and why would that be extreme focus everything. yeah extreme focus you're in the moment I know that sounds rather overused, but being in the moment is key. If you can't stay in the moment, you're probably distracted and you're probably preoccupied and you're not get, uh, using 100%, 100 of your mental faculties to, to be focused, right? Um, and uh, I was gonna mention that part of understanding and being able to get into that flow state is being self-aware. So if there's one thing uh, to take away from this talk is just learning to be a little more self-aware. So some of us are, are very self-aware in some areas, but not others. But if you can increase your self-awareness by just a reflecting after stuff, um, being open to change, meaning, because right, change is hard. Humans don't like change, as we can see with this whole COVID thing. <laughs> it's, it's really, really challenging for people to get outside their comfort zone. But if you can be as reflective as possible and do some of this breathing to just ground you, you can be a lot more 
I guess, uh, open to and being curious to, to change. And the other thing I wanted to uh, say follows this is that you then um, now have the power to choose. So my philosophy for this whole mental skills training is uh, accept, well, it's, it's, there's actually a, um, a, a, what do you call it? It's, it's a, it's an actual research philosophy of uh, mindful acceptance commitment. Um, that's actual therapy. So what you do is you're put yourself in a mindful state so you can accept the situation, kind of what we were doing, acknowledging the situation at the beginning of this. And then once you've accepted and distanced yourself from the emotion, then you can commit to a new course of action. So what that does is you're unhooking yourself from your current kind of fixed mindset to be able to shift your, the way you think just to, uh, to what you want to, you know, the story you want to tell, right? Because the old story is sometimes suboptimal. You want to be able to shift that story, your own story. And the, and the way to do that is through something as basic as breathing and then the power of choice. So I call it this choosing to do something that's going to be more beneficial. So as one example, let's say you're doing it. This is, this is how it could relate to like descending, right? So let's say you're descending. I have some clients who are, are very fearful of descending. Um, and so I ask them to look ahead, right? So sometimes they, they, can't, they can't help it. They have to just look 10 feet in front of them. And that's obviously not optimal for, for descending. So, so what can you do? Maybe you do some, a quick exhale, deep breath, and then you do a mantra. It could be just like, it could literally be, um, I don't know, Amy, you're an amazing descender. Is there anything you use to do the crazy stuff that you're? Oh, yeah. I guess something is that focus and focus could mean look ahead. So again, it's like an instructional cue. So kind of tying it all together, it's something that simple. You can just, and, and knowing and having the confidence that this has worked in the past is, is helpful to um, being able to use something that that resonates with you or and so you're practicing this and yeah to me it's like for me the most fearful thing on this morning ride is the descent off of ultimate um at the end of the ride where you're going like mock speed uh down this hill and i have to like literally just tell myself i i got this and that's so that's my mantra and then just and to look ahead so um i'm choosing to do this so this is also the fear factor of doing something dangerous or doing something as crazy as trusting Dr. Clyde's nutritional, because <laughs> that looked pretty complicated to me to have to do all those calculations. So, you know, anyways, but you can, so what, what you do is you, you have a choice and you can also simplify and then also be, uh, what should we say? Be uh, comfortable or confident in the fact that you're doing most of it and that the rest, the rest isn't that important. So a lot of it's just your, your headspace. Can you wrap your head around, uh, and this is talked about perfectionistic versus, or the 80-20 rule. Actually, James taught me that one, um, where you're able to recognize I'm doing most of it and the, the rest will be okay. So this is the same thing with when you're doing race preparation mentally to really, to really be comfortable and confident with what you're doing instead of going into the headspace of, oh, I didn't do enough, never enough. You know, these other people are far more prepared than me. But if you can put yourself in that calmer headspace where you realize I have choices, that actually, I think, gets you kind of to that flow state a little more. Um, so let me just uh, give you one more very simple tip that I think might be helpful. Um, is So everyone's heard of... Uh, things within your control and things out of your control. And so how many of you uh, tend to focus on things out of your control or outside your control for a race? So like example is, you know, a course, maybe it's wet, it's slippery. And then you're, or you think it's gonna be wet or slippery or it's, you know, you're hot, humid, you don't do well in hot, humid weather. That's something you can't really control for, but you can prepare for. So in other words, it doesn't really, help to stress over it, but you can do things in advance of the race to, to prepare for it. Or maybe it's like what your competition's doing, right? How many times have you looked at, you know, how 
you know, when people used to oil their legs, they're like, wow, look how fit they look. Um, but clearly that's not everything, right? But you can get intimidated by your competition also outside your control. Uh, but you can get to know your competition and understand what they might do, but you can't control what they're going to do. And then there's the, I call it FOPO, fear of other people's opinions. How many of you have fear of other people's opinions or it could be fear or other people's expectations of you? So let's say you're a kid and your parents are investing all this time and money in your sport. And I know I have several clients who they feel like you know, they have to do well because their parents have spent all this time and money on them. And so they have that pressure. And again, that's, is that really true? You, know, you have to ask yourself that question. Um, but in your control, there's a whole host of things that you can control before the race even starts, right? There's your attitude, um, your nutritional piece, your sleep, your training, um, what you do, uh, and actually what you can do to alleviate all of these thoughts is have a very solid pre-race warm-up or pre-race routine. So that's something I emphasize with my athletes a lot is get that in weight, I call it a de-stressing activity, which is do your pre-race warm-up. That really reduces stress because it just gets you in familiar uh, ground, on familiar ground. Um, and then you also realize you can control your effort level, your self-talk, that's a big one, um, how you respond, right? So in the moment, how you respond is crucial, right? So like if you hesitate uh, for a split second, you might have missed your opportunity, right? But by the same token, if you aren't patient, like knowing when to be patient and when not to be patient, all that stuff is, is stuff you can control but it's also through what you've done in advance of the actual event is to give you that confidence to say, I can do it uh, in the moment and be okay with it. So, and then the last piece is your motivation is also within your control. So a lot of what I work with athletes on is something as simple as what do you value in life? What are your core values? What are your core passions? Why are you doing what you're doing? So a lot of the reasons, a lot of the problem I've seen with, Motivation is when people don't know why they're doing something and they, they've lost the plot. They kind of, they get so sucked into the routine. They don't understand why they're doing it. And then when they get to that point, that low point where they just feel like everything's conspiring against them, they lose their motivation because they've lost the, the why. So a lot of the question, a lot of what you can ask yourself is why I'm doing it. You don't want to be doing that in the moment so much. This is more like a, overarching thing it's not so helpful if you're in the moment but that that wide piece is huge um and then the results trap is the other big thing that i wanted to mention at the very this end of this is that how many of us start focusing on results too too early or too much so for example you're looking for upgrade points as a bike racer okay that's great to have that as an overarching goal or let's say christine you wanted to win a medal in the Olympics, that's a good overarching goal. But in the moment, does that help you? No, all you can focus on at that moment is your effort level. So the point being is if you can just focus on what's in your control, which is mostly the effort level, which is mostly being in the moment, then you can take that whatever race you're in or whatever activity you're doing the furthest, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so. This again, I was going to say, where do you, how do you put all this together? So you've seen this from yesterday, but I'm going to have the sports psychology slant in it. So this is Christine's slide from yesterday um, where she has her goal, right? You have your goal. Again, this is the overarching outcome goal. And then you have, oops, then you say, okay, I'm inspired by Zola Budd and Mary Decker from the 84 Olympics. And then, oh, I want to go to the Olympics. Oh, gee, that just happens to be November of 2003 and the Olympics are in August of 2004. Okay, well, I got some time. So you set the goal, set your process, you know, the outcome goal, you set your process goals, your performance goals, and then sits down with her uh, team director, Karen Brems, and says, okay, the only way I'm going to win or go to the Olympics is to win the Olympic trials, which are in June of 2004. Okay, so. And the only automatic selection is winning the time trial. So she does 
what am I going to have to do to do this? I'm going to have to do some time trials, get a time trial bike and, you know, start leveraging my uh, performance tools or mental performance tools, which she already had. She didn't need some sports psych person to help her with it. Um, but she was able to, you know, put together a solid pre-race warm-up routine that was just, and then also more importantly, worry about things within her sphere of influence. And so that's the equipment, being comfortable with it, even though I sucked as a mechanic, she was able to still be confident in me. That's what counted. Didn't matter that, anyways, I want to go into how, how my, her bike was, wasn't nearly as good as Tristan Armstrong's bike, but we, we, she was confident with it and that's what counted. There was no doubt. And there was the process goals of using something as simple as the beat the clock time trial. Be, you know, it's a, it's a little local uh, can a cancer fundraiser on Kenyatta Road to be mile to, as milestones. And so she didn't go to big races. She just did that, did the imagery. And then in 2000, uh, June of 2004, she wins the Olympic trials. And so what she did in the process was really just use very simple tools of belief, believing in herself, moving past her mistakes by choosing to, to focus on what she could do better after she had any hiccups. And then also the power of her team, which we didn't even mention, which she harnessed her team and her team all believed in her. And she was able to, I, I honestly think, right, Christine, you used your team or the team fed off you and you fed off the team and that helped you. Yeah. Yeah. And then I want to ask you, Christine, since I have you here, what was your, if you were talking about getting into the zone, what, what were factors that helped you get, you know, more easily slip into that zone? Cause that seemed like a pretty easy place to, for you to get to. Um, I actually always found it easier to get in the zone on the Hyper focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and so a lot of that was that that you notice she talks about hyper focus, and so all of these little tools that I mentioned, which take a lot of practice, kind of facilitate that. Um, but I wanted to dumb it down and keep it simple. So I kind of uh, put it down to, this is just another way of what I was saying, what I said earlier, which is acknowledge the situation that you're in. And part of that acknowledgement is also appreciating the situation you're in. So not just, like, just saying, I'm accepting this, you're appreciating it. You don't have to be resigned to it, but you appreciate maybe the enormity or whatever. So you're not, you're just basically not beating yourself up. So that's part of the acknowledgement. And then using the breath as your anchor. Um, and then once you're, the anchoring also pulls you back from the emotional response that you have to a, some kind of pressure situation and then adjust. Cause you have these tools, whether it's self-talk, that you practiced, you know, imagery and so forth, then you can respond uh, more optimally to the situation. So, I mean, with that, I've kind of um, wanted to keep it somewhat short, ask people have questions. Um, oh, and the last piece I wanted to mention is if you, the more you smile, which is hard to do now through the mask, but the more you smile in competition, I think the better you will do. There's actually been research uh, showing where they, I don't know if James, you heard this, but there was a uh, study where they had people on exercise bikes and they were exercising to exhaustion and they had a, they flashed smiley faces at like 200 millisecond bursts on a screen um, while they were, you know, the control group didn't get anything. Uh, maybe they got sad faces. I can't remember, but, but the ones who uh, had the smiley faces flashed at them lasted, I think on average, what's it? three minutes longer, I might be making that up, but they lasted significantly longer uh, than the ones that had no smiley faces. And of course, people probably heard of Amy Cuddy, the 
Harvard sociologist who who talks about power poses and, and body language and and smiling. Um, and then of course our good old teammate Horner always seemed to be smiling when he was under a lot of duress, going really fast. But I think it was a grimace. But 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 honestly, it's the jaw muscles in that smiling, uh, whatever uh, the smiling not formation, whatever you call it, is is what. I think helps. And so I anecdotally, a lot of my clients who practice that have noticed that they're, they seem to be happier and thus they do better in their, in their races. So with that, I wanted to leave you that with that and then ask if there are any questions or no, no questions. That means we can, uh, I know you're running late. You can, you guys can move on. I, I'm not hearing anybody. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just want to leave it with uh, amazing things happen when you allow them. That means don't force it. And I wanted to say this this photo was taken at, at 2000. Uh, so that was Olympics, one of the Olympics I went to. And I'm, I'm actually in this picture. I'm in like that boat right there <laughs> with, uh, on, with my training partner's boat. So it was quite spectacular being, being on the harbor at the Millennium whatever uh, celebration so yeah thanks for having me and i uh, appreciate it <laughs>